Last week we began looking at Satan. In the Old Testament, Satan is a, a fun and interesting figure. It's in the Old Testament, the Satan is a job title. It's a description. It's, it's something you do, like a, being a prosecuting attorney. It's the, one, the Satan is the one who accuses or blocks the path when you should not go down that path. As we wrapped up with an un understanding of the Satan, this job performed by one of the angels, we saw that... Um, it shows up in the New Testament in the letters of Paul and the way he understands this Satan. And, and I think the best comparison I could make is the Satan ends up being like a scalpel. You never want to see a doctor holding it, but you trust the doctor to use it if they have to. And that's kind of the way the Satan is used. You don't ever want to have God send you the Satan, but you trust the one who sends it. Well, that's, that's wrapping up with the Old Testament. And then times start to change. By the time we get to the end of the Old Testament, the, the Jewish people had started thinking and pondering this whole Satan thing. They come back from exile, this time when the entire Jewish people are taken out of their land and taken off to the Bab by the Babylonian Empire. And as they come back and they start to rebuild, they've had this experience of conflict, of disaster. They've had this experience, much like a soldier going off to war can never quite see things the same again. When they come back from exile, they don't see things quite the same. When Zechariah, one of the prophets, when he writes of what God tells him to say, he, he writes of a time, it's in Zechariah 3, when the Satan is accusing the high priest and God has to tell the Satan to back off and rebukes him. It's still the Satan, but he's not exactly towing the line and doing as God would tell him. Something is getting squirrely and changing. Later on, also, that's about 500 or so B.C., um, there's another instance about this same time period near the end of the Old Testament that, that has Satan showing up in, in, in a different way. If you've read through the Old Testament, you've noticed that there are two complete histories. There's First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and then there's First and Second Chronicles. And these two tell the same history, and they, they give two different versions of, of the same history. And, and what's going on here is the, the Chronicles version is done later, at, in this about 500 or so, after the exile, and they're retelling their history. And they get to the point where King David does something really stupid. He, he, he does this census to count all the people in the land so he can depend upon his army and not on God. And there's a whole backstory here. But uh, when they get to the point where David makes this stupid decision, what it says is, Satan arose against Israel and incited David to number Israel. And here it is. This is the first time that someone said, Satan made me do it. This is the first time. What happened, uh, I told you last week that every time Satan shows up in the Old Testament, it's always the Satan. It's always this job title. This is the exception. Here at the very end of the Old Testament, we see it just as Satan, just as a name. And so that's the end of the Old Testament. The Old Testament wraps up around 500 B.C. When does Jesus show up? about five centuries later, right? So we have this big old chunk of time right there in the middle. It's called the intertestamental period. It's a very boring name, but that's what it is. It's between the Old and New Testament, the intertestamental period. And during this time, the Jewish people continue to kind of contemplate and ponder who Satan is. They, they come across verses like Isaiah 14 that talks about how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the, the bottomless pit. In the original context for this, this star of heaven, who gets arrogant and then God puts in, in his place, the original context is that speaking of the Babylonian emperor who had taken over Israel, conquered Israel, and, and then had been cast down. But the Jewish people, they look at that and say, well, that sounds like someone else, too. That's starting to sound like, well, someone who is arrogant and thrust down into the pits. That, that starts to sound like the, the image we have of Satan down in, in hell. That, that's where that starts to come from, Isaiah 14. And um, so we get, have this, this time when they're kind of chewing on who is Satan? Is Satan no longer seems to be this angel that does what God wants, but has turned away. And, and it gets to be this sense of a family feud. There, there begins to be these myths and stories 
there's one, and it's kind of a campfire type story, but there's one story that floats around at the time that when God created humanity and gathered all of the angels to bow down before humanity, Satan is the one that would not bow because he would not bow for, to someone younger than him. And so there's these stories that uh, Satan, it's kind of like a family feud, the brother who wouldn't get along with the rest. And so this is the understanding of Satan that all the Jewish people have as they enter the first century. And Jesus shows up and he's running around doing his thing. And, um, and in the midst of Jesus going around and, and gathering disciples and teaching, he is surrounded by the Jewish people that have splintered. And it, there's no, you can't just sit, ask, what do the Jews believe in the first century? Because you have Jews who are Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes and Zealots. You have all these different flavors of Jews, and they're all disagreeing. And it's an interesting time because they're looking at each other, and how can you disagree with me if you're also a Jew? Shouldn't we get along? Shouldn't we agree? And, and so they, they have to figure out, why are they split? Who do they blame for being split? Well, it must be Satan involved. So it must be Satan working through and splitting us because I'm a Jew and you're a Jew and obviously I'm right. And if you disagree with me, Satan must be messing with you. Satan must be working in you. This is, the, the, if you remember, it's in Matthew uh, 12. Jesus is accused of being in league with Satan. That was just kind of how you discredited other Jews who you didn't agree with. Well, I disagree with him. He must be working with Satan. And, and um, the Pharisees heard this and they said, This man cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. To which Jesus said, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is not the kingdom of Satan. And so this is where we start to get th this type of imagery, right? The kingdom of God versus Satan. We start to have this, this image of this throwdown between Jesus and, and, and Satan rising in this time. And what brings this all to a head, what brings this whole cosmic perspective in, into play is a particular event. Near the end of the first century, in the years 66 to 70 AD, the Jew, some of the Jews, remember they're split in a whole bunch of different types, some of the Jews revolt against Rome. And if there are, there are certain things you never do. You never invade Russia during winter, you never start a land war in Asia, and you never try to take on the Roman legions. It just is a very stupid idea. You might win once, and then they will come, and they will slaughter you, and that's exactly what happened. The Jews took on the Roman legions, and, and the Roman Empire was tired of dealing with these upstart Jews, and they sent in the legions, and they just destroyed Jerusalem. They knocked down the walls. They laid siege to it. Knocked down the walls. They destroyed the temple. They took all the gold. Anyone here ever seen the Colosseum in Rome? You know what I'm talking about, Colosseum? That was paid for with money from the Jewish temple. That's how they paid for it. They took all the gold out of the Jewish temple and brought it back to Rome and built the Colosseum. Uh, <coughs> and so there's this moment at, in 70 AD when all of the Jewish uh, factions are now scattering because Rome has been destroyed. It, imagine, it, it'd be like if you're a Catholic and they destroy Rome and you're also American and they still destroy Washington, D.C. at the same time and then destroy your hometown. I mean, that sort of sense of everything has been destroyed. The, the, Jerusalem is the head of the nation. It's the head of the religion. It's, the, it's your hometown. It's where all your people have been forever. And Jerusalem is destroyed. It is gone. It, it will not rise again. And so in the middle of this time, near the end of the first century, the Jewish people are just struggling. They're trying to figure out what to make of their future. And so this is the time in which there are four communities, four communities of, of Christians, led by four people whose name you, you'll recognize, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in this time, these four communities, led by these four Christians, they start writing down the stories of Jesus, not only so that the stories will not be forgotten, but also because if there ever was a time when people needed to understand the world, this was it. Right here at 70 AD. This is the time when everything has gone crazy, Jerusalem is destroyed, all the Jews are, are splintered and bickering with each other, and they write these Gospels, in the order they write them in, Mark comes first, and then Matthew and Luke, and then John. They write these Gospels 
to help the Jewish people understand that this, the destruction of Jerusalem, that's not the big deal. The big deal, the big cosmic battle happened years ago, decades ago, back in 33 AD. You missed the boat back then. That's when God got involved. That's when the, the fight between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan happened. That battle's already occurred. That battle's already won. This is just a later skirmish. It's a shame, but this is not the big co cosmic battle. The Gospels present the battle between Jesus and those who oppose him as being the most important thing that has ever happened, ever. This is not just a spat between Jewish groups. This is God taking on all that is evil in the world. And, and so this is what, how you end up with this sense of Satan that we have in lar large part inherited today. What we have is this understanding of Satan is not just an angel, but an angel who turned against God combined with the catastrophe of the destruction of Jerusalem, and then in the midst of the splintering of Jewish culture, you have people writing Gospels to help make sense of what's just happened. And so, as we see what Jesus does in the Gospels, if you read it looking for that big, grand, cosmic conflict, it, it's all over the place. How do, how do the Gospels start? What's the first thing Jesus does after he's baptized? He goes into the, the desert to strive with, to be tempted by the devil. And, and then after that, or actually, and then we get, and each of the Gospels tells us more about the devil. Mark tells us that Satan tempts Jesus. Matthew and Luke tell us, tells us how he is tempted. Luke then adds that Satan comes back later. And then John pushes it a little bit further. In the Gospel of John, Satan doesn't show up explicitly, but everything that Satan does in the earlier Gospels happens. It happens through people. Satan doesn't explicitly tempt Jesus by saying, jump, jump off the temple, become a king, do these miracles. What happens is later in the Gospel, those temptations show up in the voices of people. And so when you read the Gospel of John, Satan is using people to get at Jesus, whether they realize it or not. After this, Jesus is begin, begins casting out demons. And, and how do we usually look at all these demons being cast out? Do all, when you're reading through the Bible, do you stop and ponder them usually? I, I don't. I mean, honestly, I tend to just keep on cruising past them so I can get to the good stuff, right? Get to Jesus' parables. But if you look at it as this big cosmic conflict, these are not just things Jesus is doing between preaching. The, the, that's the conflict. Jesus is casting out demons because he is casting out the foot soldiers of Satan. And then when Jesus gathers his own disciples, it's not just so he can have some buddies to take a walk with. Jesus is gathering his disciples so he can send them out and do the same. When we read about Jesus sending out the 70, he sends them out to cast out demons. And then when they return, what does he say? I saw Satan falling from heaven, falling from, from the skies. And so what Jesus is doing is engaging in this battle between the kingdom of God and, and the kingdom of Satan. And, it, and it, this comes up again and again when Jesus uh, talks about the parable of the seeds. You, throw, you, you sow seeds and some falls on good ground, some falls on hard ground, some falls on ground full of weeds. Jesus says, who plants the weeds? Satan does. Satan is the one who plants the weeds that chokes out faith in, in me. This all comes to a head when Satan influences Judas to turn on Jesus, leading, on the, leading to the events of Good Friday in which Jesus dies. And the classic like first and second century understanding of what happens when Jesus dies is that he raids hell. He bursts into hell because he has died, and Satan thinks he has won, but then he breaks the bonds of hell, destroys the gates of hell, and, and this is kind of like Rambo Jesus. Jesus is breaking into hell so he can lead the prison get breakout, so he can lead everyone out from Alcatraz. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, how people understand this cosmic battle that is happening. <clears throat> As you look at this conflict in the Gospels between Jesus and, and Satan, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of evil, the prince of error, it's referred to in multiple different ways. What the Gospels show us is that the people who are most likely to cause problems for Jesus are the Jews, right? It, it, again and again, it is the Jews who are the ones who refuse to hear Jesus. Jesus says, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, echoing what Isaiah had said centuries before about how if, 
It's in Isaiah 6. Their, air, their ears are dull and their eyes are dim. Otherwise, they might see, understand, and be healed. And so Jesus is echoing the same critique of the prophets from centuries ago. Jesus says how families will be split, and the Jewish family is definitely split. And, and so this is the way that the Gospels talk about those who oppose Jesus. Satan works with the people who are closest to him. Now, <clears throat> so we can read... It's hard to read the Gospels without noticing this. And it would be easy to walk away with the Gospels to say, you know, the Jews are the bad guys. But there's a problem with that. First, by the, by the time you get to the Gospel of John, it's condemning all, of Jew, all Jews. And, well, Jesus is a Jew, the disciples are Jews, Paul is a Jew, a lot of the early Christians are Jews. So it gets to the point where you just can't say that Jews are the bad guys. It is that Jews are the people who are close by through whom Satan is working. And so to say this as clearly as possible, the Jews have been and always have been God's chosen people. Please don't walk out of here saying Andy is being anti-Semitic. That's not the case. What is happening here is that the Gospels are using the Jews as a symbol for anyone who rejects Jesus. And so as you walk down, according to this logic, if you walk down the street and you run into someone who rejects Jesus, the Gospel of John would refer to them as one of the Jews. It had nothing to do with their ethnic background, but that's just the logic of how the story is being told. The Jews are the people who reject Jesus. When we look at the Gospels and we read them, we have this sense of cosmic conflict, this worldview between ultimate good on Jesus and ultimate evil and Satan. And it's a worldview that we don't often have, right? When we look around during the day, on Tuesday afternoon, you don't look out your door and see someone walking by and saying, that is an agent of Satan sent by the evil one to destroy my soul, right? That's not how we tend to think of people. We look out the door and say, hey, that's Tim. How you doing? I mean, that's the, we send peop, see people as pretty good or maybe not quite as good, but we don't look out the door and see in quite this cosmic sense of good and evil. It's a rather stark and dramatic worldview, yet that is what the Gospels portray. And we're left with this question, what do we do with this? Should we all go out the door and invigorated by this reading of the gospel, should you go up to anyone who hasn't gone to church this week and tell them that because you did not go to church, because you're not actively following Jesus, that you are obviously an agent of Satan on the side of the kingdom of the devil, doomed to, for, to eternal damnation until you get to church next Sunday at 11 a.m. <clears throat> Sorry, I ranted at the last sermon, starting to lose my voice. That was a lot more impressive an hour ago. <laughs> but is, is that what this is supposed to be? We read about this cosmic battle and we're supposed to go out and just stump on people because if you're not in church, you're obviously of the devil? Eh, I don't think so. Don't try that. Not a good idea. What the Gospels do portray, though, is that division is of Satan. When the Jews are divided amongst themselves, it is Satan at work. When Christians are divided amongst themselves, it is Satan at work. When we are divided from each other, that is Satan at work. And that matters day by day. And so when we get up tomorrow morning, when we begin our day by pr in, in prayer and Bible study, that is not us getting up and doing something that's good for us, like, you know, you work out, you eat right, you pray. I mean, that's not... No, that's not how we think about it. You eat right and work out and that's good. But you study the Bible because you, what you do today matters. You pray today so that your mind might be shaped by God and you might go out as an agent of peace in a world that is full of conflict which pleases Satan to, just so much. It's an election year, right? How much mudslinging and junk are we going to hear in the coming months? And as we go into our days, and as we get up and we face the conflict that is between us here locally, and all the arguments and all the problems, when we are agents of peace, committed to making peace, to resolving conflict, when we are praying for each other, when we are serving each other humbly, we are taking part in the building of the kingdom of God, 
And when we are giving in to the inclination to sabotage others, to talk smack about others, to, to be in conflict with each other, to be disrespectful to others, that's not neutral. That's not just kind of getting along. That is the work of Satan. And that is building the tearing down of the kingdom of God. What you do today, this afternoon, and tomorrow matters. Because as we see in the gospel, our struggle with the powers and principalities, our struggles with Satan, is not about our disagreements with someone way off in the distance. Our struggles with the, for, the, for Jesus and against the powers are Satan. Our, has everything to do with how do we treat our neighbor tomorrow. The neighbor who just cannot seem to mow his grass often enough, or the waitress who can't get our food to us quick enough, or the person who you think is talking smack about you. When you are involved, when we are involved in making peace in our community, then we are building the kingdom of God. And when we are not, we are pleasing Satan. What you do to matter mar matters. So get up, and pray like it. Amen.